Uh, Romans chapter 2, verse 1. Therefore you are inexcusable. Therefore you are inexcusable. Right there in first, uh, verse 1, right off the bat, we have this word therefore. Anytime you're in the Bible and you come to the word therefore, you need to stop and think, what is it therefore? It's a, uh, a, a, a hinge word, like we would use however and then. So uh, it means that he's continuing on a thought that he's already established. So to make sure that we maintain the context, I want us to grab a little bit of where we left off last week in Romans chapter 1. Uh, I want us to at least look at this verse here. There's so much in, Ro- in Romans chapter 1, but in verse 20 of Romans chapter 1, if you just turn back a little bit there, There's this truth, there's a whole lot of them that are established, but this this amazing truth in verse 20, Paul says this, For since the creation of the world, His, talking about God as it's a capital H there, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. No one has or will have a good excuse to stand before God one day and say, I I just didn't believe. I mean, I didn't realize that you were out there. I didn't realize that I had an obligation to you. Paul establishes clearly here. Here in Romans chapter 1, that no one will be able to say that. All you got to do is look out your window. All you got to do is survey this world, this earth, this creation. Creation declares who He is, the Bible tells us. And no one will have an excuse. So that being said, He goes on to establish a little bit of what it looks like when people reject God. When people reject God, the Bible says three or four times here, Paul says that God just lets them go. And we talked about last week, that's one of the worst things you can ever experience, is that God would let you go, meaning turn you over, let you have your own way. Our ways are horrible, they really are. And the worst thing that we can see in our environment, our surrounding in this world, are people who have, who have been let go by God to do the things that they do. And when that happens, this is what it looks like in verse 28. And even as they did not retain God in their knowledge, they reject Him. God gave them over to a debased mind to do things which are not fitting. Being filled with all unrighteousness. Now, being filled with all unrighteousness is what He's about to lay out what that looks like. Unrighteousness is that which is against God against His plan, against His will, against His nature, against His standards, what it, everything about who He is and what He stands for and what He wants and expects of us. When we go against those things, the Bible calls that unrighteousness. And this is what it looks like. This is how we see it. The Bible says earlier in this chapter, Paul says that the wrath of God is revealed on mankind. Is, meaning present tense. We see the wrath of God um, revealed right now now how is that so we don't see that you know the the fire and brimstone coming from heaven we don't see the a great flood covering all the earth what is this wrath of god it's the result of god being done with somebody until and i'm not talking about people that where god says uh, you can't ever come back he's just saying i'm letting you have your way you're resisting me you don't want me you refuse me i'm gonna let you have your own way and we see the wrath of god saying have your own way is a horrible thing talk about wrath of God you can sit here and complain all day long about how ugly it might seem that that, that God would 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 do some of the things that he's done in the Bible as he's he has physically let out his wrath on the earth before and the Bible tells us that it's going to happen again But you know what? The worst thing that you can do and experience of God letting his his wrath on is him saying have your way have your way do your thing And the worst that that we can imagine is that we see all this ungodliness, this unrighteousness in verse 29. Being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They're whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. This is this what it looks like when God turns us over. And these are the words that He uses several times in these verses. It says in verse 24, therefore God gave them up. And it says there like three times, God let them uh, turn them over to their own ways. 
Now, I'm going to tell you something that's worse than, than fire, worse than a flood, worse than the things that we think of concerning the wrath of God, is the unrighteousness of man. The wickedness of man. It's an ugly, ugly, horrible thing. Now, Paul paints this picture and says that these people are guilty. He concludes that in verse 32. Who, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death. This righteous judgment of God, meaning God's uh, 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 conclusion, His judgment, His verdict on them for being this way, is death. That is it. We know, and we'll cover it later in Romans chapter 3 when we get there, the wages of sin is death. The result of this is death. The punishment of this is death. The wrath of this to come is death. There's wrath that is currently being revealed as God has taken His hands off of people. I'm going to tell you, it's the worst thing that can happen. That's the worst thing that can happen is God taking His hands off of people and their wrath, and the wrath of that is revealed. But there's another wrath that is to be revealed and that's the wrath of God. And what is the punishment here? It is death. The worst thing that we can experience is the opposite of what we prayed for when we sang that last song before we came to the, to, to the sermon. Is we said, Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. We call out for your presence. We want your presence. We, now, when we sang that song, we sang that song as if that's what we really, really wanted. The presence of God. We wanted God. That is the great prize and the great reward. The eternal life is nothing except for its eternal life with Him. Whenever God tells us that he's, he's giving us eternal life, the gift of eternal life is the saying, you get to spend eternity with me. Eternal life without God is nothing. It's, it's, it has no value. But eternal life with God, He is the great reward. And the great punishment is the absence of God. Being away from God. What we say we wanted is the presence of God. Holy Spirit, come and be with us. God, be with us. The, the, the opposite of that is God not being with us. And that's something we don't want. If we love Him. If we have experienced Him. If we have a relationship with Him. If you've not had a relationship with somebody, then you, know, you don't miss them. But once you've had an intimate relationship with someone and then they are, their presence is away from you, it's, it's heartbreaking. It's something that you don't want to experience. Now, the thing is, is that if we love God, we wouldn't want anything to do outside of Him. We would want to be with Him. His presence is everything. Verse 32, Who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. So he concludes, now there weren't chapters back then, uh, but he concludes that thought to an extent before he goes on to the next one. And he, he concludes that thought with, it's not just those that you look out and see that are doing those things, but the, those who are guilty of those things by doing them and those who are guilty by approving them. Now I want us to think about that word before we go into chapter 2. Approving of them. That is where we are at in our nation. It's not only that we look at some of the things like we talked about in chapter 1. If anybody says that, that in, in, in the New Testament, the Bible doesn't deal with homosexuality, it's right here in chapter 1. It's also elsewhere, but it's right here. That's kind of really where we are. Homosexuality, sexual immorality, whether it's homosexuality or gender issues or just people living with one another and having sex outside of marriage, sexual immorality that's rampant in our country. Not only... Do they want us to keep our mouth shut about it as far as anything negative that we would have to say? They really come to the point that we, they want us to approve of it. That's where we're at now where they, they say, no, no, no. If you don't, not only if you disagree, if you don't approve of it, you, you're a hater against us. And that's where we're at right now in our society. And the Lord says that, that no, we can't approve of any of those things. Now here's the thing. If we approve of something, I want you to know what that is. 
Okay, I want you to know what it means. If we approve of something, saying, okay, that's an acceptable lifestyle, that's an acceptable thing, that's an acceptable behavior, and I'm not just talking about, about homosexuality or people in sexual relationships outside of marriage. I'm not just talking about gender identity issues. I'm talking about all sorts of ungodliness that we, we think is okay if we particularly like a person. If we love that person, that's okay that this is going on in your life. The, these things that, that we approve of, you know what that is? That's judging. No, it is. When we, when we, we always think of judging as, oh, don't judge me, don't, meaning don't say anything bad about my, what I'm doing. If you say something good about what you're doing, they're doing, it's judging. It's still judging. When a judge declares, oh, you're innocent, or judging, he declares that you are guilty, both of them are judging. And yet here Paul is starting, a, he's ending this last statement right here with, if you judge that as being good, you are guilty. Therefore, and he goes into chapter 2. Therefore, you are excuse, inexcusable. I mean, just with you have no defense for yourself. Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man. Whoever you are who judges, for in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same thing. Now, I want you to think about what's happening right here. This verse right here is very similar to Probably the world's favorite verse, and it's Matthew chapter 7. I want you to actually go ahead and turn there. Matthew chapter 7. We're going to see a verse that is, if they don't know any other verse in the world, people that want to justify what they do and excuse themselves for doing it and telling you you can't say anything to them, Boy, I tell you what, there's people that have been out in the world that can't quote any scripture, but they can quote Matthew chapter 7 verse 1. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. I guess I should turn there too, since we're going to be in that. Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Jesus is concluding, I say concluding because it's the seventh chapter of three chapters here that we refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus stands before the Jews. And he starts laying out things for them that was blowing their minds. He starts saying things that they had never heard before. What he's doing is he's being the Word of God. The Bible says in John chapter 1, when we went through that, that Jesus is the Logos, the Word. That's the Greek for, for Word. It's Logos. He is, he is the one who reveals the mind and the will of God, and He is being the Logos right here. In the, in the Sermon on the Mount, He is breaking down things and helping them to understand God's will and His plan like they've never known before. Now he gets to, to this, uh, this part as he's going to be concluding the sermon in chapter 7. And he says, judge not that you be not judged. Well, that is very similar to what we just read in Romans chapter 2 and verse 1. When Paul says that, hey, you have no business judging. He says, he says you're bringing condemnation on himself if you reread that verse. And so, <laughs> here's this verse where people say, and matter of fact, I heard it at least twice in this building before church started. Now, they were, I think they were for the most part being kidding. I think somebody said, don't judge me, because they were dressed very relaxed. Well, you ain't going to get no judgment from me. This is as dressed up as I get. And there was someone else, I think, I, think, I don't know who it was. Somebody else said, don't judge me, don't judge me. We throw that around a lot. It means don't say anything. You don't, don't, don't evaluate me. Don't say anything negative about me. Well, that is the, the catchphrase for all of those out in the world doing anything that they want to do. And they say to any Christian, you, according to your own belief system, according to your own Bible, can't say anything to me for what I do. Romans, or they'll say, judge not that you be not judged. They can't tell you it's Matthew. They can't tell you it's chapter 7 or verse 1. But they can say, judge not that you be not judged. That means keep your mouth shut. God doesn't want you talking to me about what I'm doing wrong. Is that the case? Is that what Jesus is saying? This is what Jesus is saying, is judge not that you be not judged, for with what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So we see that Jesus is saying, however you're judging somebody, you best believe that you're going to get that same judgment back to you. So don't judge people where you're guilty. Don't judge people if you're guilty. 
Now, Jesus does continue to say this, and this is what they don't want to know, is that they might be okay with verse 3 and 4, but they want to stop there. It says in verse 3, And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye, but do you, do you not consider the plank in your own eye? So you got this plank, which is a very long beam, that's in your eye, and you're walking around like this. And, oh, I see a speck in your eye over there. You need to do something about that. I, I'm telling you right now. And they got this beam in their eye. So that's what, you know, when we, we want to stop right there, that's where the world wants us to stop. And it says, you know, you don't say anything to me about what's going on in my life. Jesus is not saying <coughs> that we don't approach each other about issues in our life. Judgment is not a bad thing. Matter of fact, Jesus says in John chapter 7, verse 24, he says that uh, exercise good judgment. Don't judge the way people judge, looking on the outside. He says, but use righteous judgment. So here's righteous judgment, and it says this. In verse 4, it says, Or how can you say to your brother, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye. <coughs> Jesus says, hypocrite. First remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Oh my goodness. Maybe now we see the point Jesus was making all along. Wasn't that if you see somebody speck in their eye, you turn around and walk away. What he says is if you see somebody has got something wrong in their life, you need to make sure your heart is right first off. You need to make sure that you're walking with the Lord like you need to be. But if you're repentant and you're clear and you've repented of the sin, you've got this beam out of your eye, then with love you need to come to your brother and you need to deal with it. But see, we don't evaluate whether our brother has removed the beam from his eye. We just stick with the fact that you don't come and judge me. You don't say anything to me about my life. Well, maybe they have removed the beam from their eye and now they are with love coming to you to talk to you about issues in your life maybe the lord is wanting to do that for you today maybe he's wanting to remove the beam from your eye or maybe he's trying to remove the speck from your eye you could be on either side of this you could be the guy who first needs to remove the beam from his eye or you may be the guy that the lord is wanting that one who has removed the beam to now come and deal with you about the speck in your eye my conclusion for you here is that we need to be ready, ready either way to have the Lord deal with us with something in our life, whether it's a beam or whether it's a speck. Now, this is our big issue. We talked a couple of weeks ago about the biggest obstacle to allowing the Lord to make a change in our life, specifically as we're going through this, this journey, the book of Romans that we've titled Transformed, we took that title from Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what is the acceptable will of God. The thing is, is that we have too high a view of ourselves to where we can't be changed or transformed anymore. And Paul is literally dealing with this front and center, first and foremost, in the book of Romans, for anybody that would think too highly of themselves, you need to check yourself because you need to repent. You need to get things right. But he has to set it up in such a way that we have to first acknowledge that, yes, somebody's guilty. Matter of fact, um, you don't have to turn there. I'm just going to quickly tell you the story. It's in, it's in the notes. I'll tell you it's in 2 Samuel Chapter 11 and chapter 12, but I'm just going to tell you what happens in chapter 11 of 2 Samuel. David, the king of Israel, he, <coughs> it was in a time when the kings went out to war, is what the, the chapter starts out with. It was a time when the kings went out to war, but David did not go out to war. And being the king, he, you know, he, he was able to go out on his rooftop and he would look out on the other rooftops in Jerusalem. If you see pictures of Jerusalem for that, from that time period, you see that's, that's people did a lot of things on top of their roof, roof, including Bathsheba was bathing on her rooftop. And David got a little look at that and he liked what he saw. But her husband Uriah was a soldier in, in the military. He was actually out to war. And so David called for Bathsheba. He committed adultery with her. And then realizing that she could possibly become pregnant, he calls, he sends a letter, and he calls for Uriah to bring to come back to Jerusalem. 
Now, he doesn't say anything about, hey, uh, uh, Uriah, I need you back. Uriah thinks he's just bringing a message to David. And so uh, Uriah comes and reports to David, and uh, David says, oh, thank you, thank you. He kind of makes it like it had really does have nothing to do with Uriah. And he goes, uh, uh, you know what, before you go back, go, go spend the night with your wife. Go spend the night with your wife. Well, why would he want that? You stop and think about it. David's like, if she comes up pregnant, I want this guy to think that it's his baby. But Uriah was a good man. And Uriah could not go and lie in his bed with his wife knowing that his brothers in arms were out there on the battlefield laying down their lives. So you know what Uriah did? He went and laid down and slept outside of his door. And so the next morning... He has to go report to David, and David um, uh, asked him about what's going on. He says, I didn't, I didn't go in there and, and, and lay with my wife last night. It wouldn't be right. Well, David still got this concern that what if this woman comes up pregnant? And so he sends a letter to the captain of the, of the military and sends it by the hand of Uriah, and the letter says, put Uriah on the front line. Uriah is put on the front line. And he dies. Bathsheba is pregnant. And David ends up taking her and marrying her. A little time goes by. This is David, a man after God's own heart. David, someone who really, really was close to God. David, this king of Israel appointed by God. And at that time, there were and had been and, and were after that prophets to the nations who were, who were a mouthpiece for God to come and speak to the nation and speak to kings. And Nathan was a prophet and the Lord told him to go talk to David. Now, these are the words of the Lord. Neither, these are not the words of Nathan. This is important. These are the words of the Lord. Nathan comes before David. He says, David, I've got to tell you something. Well, any of us that are familiar with David, David before he was king, what did he did? What did he do? He was a shepherd, and he was a good shepherd. When we read the Psalms twenty-three, the Lord is my shepherd. He was drawing from these illustrations, being a shepherd himself, and he was a great shepherd. He laid down. He, he was willing to lay down. He risked his life against bear and lion to save his his lambs. He loved his lambs. He was he was a really, really, really good shepherd. And so Nathan comes to him and says, "Hey, David," he says. There was a, a, a rich man who had a whole lot of sheep, and he had some company coming over. And he had a neighbor who only had one sheep, but that sheep was his neighbor's like favorite sheep, man. They loved it. The guy, they, they brought the sheep in his house. Man, he was friends with the whole family, and the sheep was like a, like just, so, you know, a, 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 just a very, very close pet. Well, the king, I mean, the rich man didn't want to waste one of his uh, lambs, so he actually takes his neighbor's lamb and kills it of course, breaking the heart of, the, of his neighbor, kills it to feed his, to his guest. And, and Nathan says to David, he tells him this, and David, you know, being sensitive as one who, who knows what it's like to have a lamb who's close to you, he says, this man must die. That was David's conclusion. That wasn't even true. I mean, the Bible said that, that if, if you committed adultery with somebody, you killed somebody, the penalty was death. But if you, if you took somebody's lamb... Then you replaced it with seven lambs or something like that. I don't remember off the top of my head. But that was not the penalty for stealing somebody's lamb. But David said, this man is worthy of death. And Nathan says, you are the man. You are the man. Because he took Uriah. David had many wives. And he took Uriah's wife. Killed Uriah. Way worse than this. And then David did repent. He realized, but... Do you realize how he had to see the sin in somebody else's life before he could acknowledge the sin in his own life? That's not the way it's supposed to be, but that was the way the scenario played out. That's not the way it's supposed to be, but that's how we are. And I want us to, to not be a David today. I don't want us to be so blind to our own need to repent that we, we can't see it. We can't see it unless somehow we were to look at somebody else and then we find out, oh, they were talking about us all along. They were talking about, that Nathan was talking about him all along. I want to, that was not Nathan's words. That was the Lord's word. That was the way that the Lord presented this for David to be able to see and hear. But I want us to share something similar to that 
In Luke chapter 7, turn with me there. Matthew, Mark, Luke, the third of the Gospels. Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, and we'll start in verse 36. Luke chapter 7 and verse 36. Then one of the Pharisees asked him, capital H, we're talk, it's Jesus, they asked Jesus to eat with them. This is a Pharisee, this is a religious uh, a leader. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him, and he, Jesus, went to eat at the Pharisee's house and sat down with him. Verse 37. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table of the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with fragrant oil. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself. Now, he didn't say this out loud. He said it to himself. This man, he's evaluating Jesus. This man, if he were a man or if he knew who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. Two acts of judgment coming from this guy right now against two different people at one time. He's now judging Jesus and he's saying, if this guy was really from God, he would have this supernatural discernment to know what a filthy, vile, sinner woman is touching him. He would not let her touch him like this. He would not let this happen. So he's judging both of them at the same time. Here's this Pharisee. And so Jesus turns to him and says, dude, what's wrong with you? And no, that is not what happened. He did the exact same thing that he had Nathan do. He said, I'm going to paint a story where you're not the one who's guilty first. And this is what Jesus begins to do. And, he, and Jesus um, uh, answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. You know, so he kind of maybe interrupted his thoughts. But uh, this was a thing that he said to himself. Oh, this was if Jesus was really a man of God, he would know who's touching him. Jesus, knowing what's in his heart, says... Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, oh, the teacher, say it. Verse 41. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they, both of them, neither one, had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. So they both own, uh, owed a creditor money, a lender. They both, two people, owed this guy money. And the amount was... It was 500 denarii. Now, a denarii is a day's wage in that day. Um, it's a day's wage. So you think about 500 denarii as a day's wage. Now, you can calculate what you make in a day and calculate that and see that, oh my goodness, it's actually quite a bit of money. So he owed him 500 days work. Now, 500 days work now, for one, no Jew worked on the Sunday, on the, well, it was actually the Sabbath day, the Saturday, the seventh day. So at least six days a week, probably they worked. So um, uh, you're actually looking at the better part of two years worth of work that they had to just pay this guy off. That does not include that you've got to pay for your own bills. This is, this is just to pay this guy off. You wrote him that much. That is an enormous amount of money. It is. It's not saying to us, like, oh, man, it's going to take me a year and a half to pay this guy off. It's going to take you a year and a half to two years to pay this off if you don't buy no food for yourself or no shoes. So it's really going to pay, may take you a lot longer than that if he allows you to eat in the meantime. This is a massive, massive debt. That's what one of them, and the other one just owed him 50. Now, that's still quite a bit, but nothing, not near as much and years of payment that this guy would have to pay. Now, he says, both of them were forgiven. He concludes this in verse 42. When they had nothing which to which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, so he asked this Pharisee, tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Which of the two that were forgiven of their debts will love him more? Well, Simon answered and said, now this is easy for Simon to evaluate this because he is not in the story. It's easy for us to look at other people's situation and really accurately see what's going on. We might be right about it, but it's easy for us to see when, it, it, when we are not in the story. And so he says this, Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. 
And Jesus said to him, you have rightly judged. You have rightly come to the right conclusion. You're absolutely right. The one that will love him more is the one who was forgiven more. And he turned to the woman, Jesus did. He turned to the woman and said to Simon, check that out. He turns to the woman but says to Simon, do you see this woman? I've entered your house. You've given me no water for my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Huh. Whoever's forgiven little, the same loves little. I want you to know that is so applicable today. When we look at these scriptures, we don't need to look and say, man, how about them people 2,000 years ago? Boy, weren't they a mess. This is so true today. It's so true of us today. We can't even say, let's look down the road and say, man, somebody sure is guilty of this. But how many of us really think that we were forgiven as much as that drug addict, convict, somebody who came out of prison or somebody who was a prostitute or a drug dealer or someone who ki uh, killed somebody? These horrible crimes. You know, when we think of them, we're thinking, man, they need Jesus. Oh, do they? Do they need Jesus? What, 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 are you not just like them? Well, no, I'm not just like them. I didn't kill anybody. I was not a drug dealer. I was not a thief. I didn't prank it. I didn't rob a bank. I didn't do these horrible things that they're doing. Well, maybe it's better that you did. Well, because at least then maybe you would not have so much pride that you would love the Lord like He forgave you of all of those things. Now, of course, I don't literally mean, man, maybe you should have done all those things. The thing is, is that you need to think of yourself as being just as guilty as they are. You know, you know, and maybe to a fault, I don't know. Probably some people would say to me as a pastor, say, you, you reveal how ugly you are about, uh, apart from Christ too much. You need to not say that some of the things that you say. I've said things about myself, of who I am apart from Christ, that... Probably people would say, oh, a preacher shouldn't say that. But, man, I know. I'm, I'm, I'm very much aware. I have, my eyes have been opened to how ugly I am. And I really don't look at myself as any worse than some of the, 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 the hardest sinful people that I've come in contact with. What, the years that I've done in prison ministry, one of the reasons I think the Lord has worked in that, because He, he convinced me a long time ago, He says, Man, if, if it wasn't for me, you'd be right there in one of those white suits. Don't you kid yourself. And I knew it. I knew it to be true. I know it to be true. And so a healthy understanding of how horrible you are apart from Him gives you an adoration, admiration and love for God like you're supposed to have. But that's what a lot of people don't have. They don't have a healthy understanding and belief of how guilty they are. They have this obstacle of how they think too highly of themselves. So, back to Romans chapter 2. And you can keep a finger over there in Matthew if you haven't, but we're going to go back there quickly. But back to Romans chapter 2. We're not going to get as near as far as I thought we were going to get here, but that's okay. We'll cut it short a little bit. Um, Romans chapter 2. So, Therefore, you are inexcusable, O man, whoever you are who judge. For in whatever you judge another, you condemn yourself, for you who are judged practice the same things. So, here we are now. Paul has laid out these horrible things. And I want you to know that when he's writing this to, to, the, the, to the saints in Rome, is the way he titled this, to, to the saints in Rome, that these... Romans, these Greeks, these Gentiles, man, they, they, were, they were involved in such horrible things. And he breaks down some of those things. Involved in horrible things. Ungodly things. And you can imagine 
the Jews that were there, and there was Jews that were living all over the place, and there were Jews that were there who was probably sitting there going, mm-hmm, ooh, get them, Paul. Get them, Paul. Jews that were saying, get these Gentiles. You know they stink. Get them, you know. And yet, Paul turns chapter 2 towards the Jews. It becomes very, very clear as you begin to read it, but um, you could even say, See in verse 7, indeed you who you are called a Jew and rest on the law. So he's talking to the Jews now. He, some people would say he was talking to the Jews all along. Well, he was talking to all of them all along. But he was including the Jews all along who thought that they were better than these horrible people. Yeah, we're all Christians, but I mean, we were actually pretty good people to begin with. Boy, I'm going to tell you something. People think that. In this room, people think that. I, I guarantee it. It's just too, too clear from the Scriptures and it's too clear as a pastor that people think, you know, I'm pretty good already. You know, I'm not like them over there. I want you to know Paul is speaking from the heart of the Lord so it's the Lord who is saying to us here this morning, oh, don't you go there. Don't you even think. You are inexcusable, oh man. You are just as guilty. You're guilty of the same things. Well, well, that's what he actually says. He says, you're guilty of the same things. And you're condemning those, you're condemning yourself for you who judge practice the same things. Now, of course, let's keep in mind, Matthew chapter 7, Jesus said, he says, first get your life right. And then you go and talk to other people. But people were guilty and they were looking at other people as if, hey, that's the guilty one. Were the Jews guilty of these things? Everything on this list, I can't actually go and show you in the Old Testament where the Jews participated in all these things. I can't. Any of the things from chapter 1 that you look at and see horrible things, I can absolutely show you in the Old Testament where Jews were doing those. I can show you in the New Testament where the Jews were doing some of these things. So was Paul saying you actually are committing adultery? You actually are killing people? You actually are doing these things physically? Well, you could say that because he, the, the Jews in general had participated in all those things. But he is speaking to them about the way God sees them. Oh, wait, the way God sees them. Matthew chapter 5. In Matthew chapter 5, we go to the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. The Sermon on the Mount begins in Matthew chapter 5. And Jesus is again, like I said, He's blowing their mind. He's telling them things. He's unveiling who God is. Because I want you to know this, that the Jews did not fulfill the law. They did not fulfill the law of God. Matthew chapter 5, in verse 19, Jesus says this. This is concerning the law. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments... And teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. If you just break any of those commandments, or you teach people to do so, you're the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of God. Whoever does the commandments means he follows them, obeys them, um, and teaches others to follow the obey and obey the laws and the commandments of God. He shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Do you want to be called great in the kingdom of heaven? Then you need to start teaching people the law of God. Oh, wait a second. We're not under the law, Steve. Boy, you no, 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 no. Back up. No, we absolutely are still under the spirit of the law. Meaning what God was looking to accomplish all along that have a reflection on who he is, he doesn't change. God doesn't change. There's some things that changed as far as some ceremonial things that were symbolic of things to come. Well, that those, some of those things have already came, and so they're no longer symbolic. They've been replaced with actual things. That, but the law that reflects how we're supposed to behave and who God is, those things have not changed. Let's talk about that. He says, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. The Pharisees, the scribes and the Pharisees, they were the ones who walked around saying, We do the will of God. We obey the law of God. If you need an example, we are the example. You look to us. We will show you how it's done. That's who the scribes and the Pharisees were. And Jesus is like, Uh-uh. You've got to be more righteous than them over there. Because they were unrighteous, actually. 
But it was a shock to them for the people, the common people that were sitting there probably on the ground as Jesus was teaching. And Jesus is telling them, you've got to be more righteous than them or you won't even enter into the kingdom of heaven. Mind blowing for them. But he explains it, what that means. Here's an example. You have heard, verse 21, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. Uh, duh, right? We know that one, right? And that's one we don't obey. We don't disobey that law. Uh, you know, probably all of us can hear. You don't, we ain't going to have to show of hands because we don't want to unveil anything. But most all of us in here can probably raise our hands and say, I have not murdered anybody. But if you were to leave your hand up, hopefully pretty soon you'd be putting it down real quickly. He says that you have heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be in danger of the judgment. And everybody was probably like, yep, amen. But Jesus continues, but I say to you, that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Okay, what is the judgment? Verse 20, 21, you kill, you're going to face God's judgment. He says, if you're just angry with your brother, brother without cause, you're going to face the judgment of God. Right there, I guarantee you people began to squirm. Because first off, he's saying something they've never heard. Now, does that mean that he is adding to the law? <coughs> no, he's not adding to the law. Matter of fact, he's going behind the law and revealing to you the intent and purpose from God with the law. He says, man, it's not, a, it's not about a list of things that you do and you do not do. It's about how you relate to God and how you relate to other people. And he's showing us right here that if you hate your, if you're angry with your brother without cause, you shall be in danger of the judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. He's saying that you have the, you got it. And it's not just that you can't kill your brother. You have to love your brother. You have to be uh, 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 not ugly to your brother. It's not that you just can't kill him. Okay, Jesus continues, and, but we're going to skip forward to verse 27. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not commit adultery. Well, I'm sure people that were there in the crowd were like, oh, I don't commit adultery. That's good. Um, I'm good. I'm good here. And he continues. But I say to you that whosoever looks at a woman to lust after her for her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So, all those that were saying, oh, I've not committed adultery. Boy, as soon as he says, if you have lusted after her um, and with, with even the intent of committing adultery, but you didn't actually do it, he says, you already did commit adultery. Meaning, you're facing the same judgment as the one who commits adultery. This is, this is taking it where they had never gone before. What he's talking about again is not actually the letter of the law, but the intent of the law and the purpose of, of what's going on behind it. Let's look at one more. Verse 43. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Now the quotation is, you love your neighbor from Deuteronomy 23. But it says, you have also heard that you hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. This is something that they did not feel obligated to do in any way. You did not love your enemies. You did not do the good to those. Now, if they had really read the Old Testament, they would see that the nature and character of God is revealed to even love those who were hateful to you. But it wasn't on the list of commandments, so they didn't have to do it. And that was the attitude they had. They had their own uh, uh, a belief about how righteous they were based on how well they obeyed the list of commandments. But here's the problem. The Jews obeyed the letter of the law, and they didn't always do that, but even if they obeyed the letter of the law, they didn't necessarily obey the spirit of the law. See, what it is is that the Bible teaches us in Romans, and we're going to talk about it, how the law was just like a schoolmaster. It was to bring us from one place to another, help us to see that we're broke. That's really what the law is. The law is like a gauge. It's like a, a thermostat or a pressure gauge that, says, that tells you what's going on on the inside. The law is to help us to understand, oh my goodness, there's something wrong with me. And it's then that we turn to the lawgiver and say, hey, I'm broke. Can you fix me? And he does. 
But that's what the law is for. It's to show you that there's a problem on the inside. And Jesus is breaking that to them right here. He says, there's an issue with you on the inside that you need to be changed from the inside. God needs to do a thing, a work in your heart. And James reveals that very well. And we'll conclude with James chapter 2. We're only going to get a couple of verses in Romans, but that's all right. Um, We're going to conclude with James chapter 2. As you're going there, I'm going to read this last verse to you in in Matthew chapter 6 as you turn into James. Jesus closes out again. There weren't chapters then. But before he goes to the next uh, part of the sermon, this last verse in chapter 5 says, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. What he's saying right there, it says, the word perfect doesn't mean flawless like we think of it today. The word perfect literally means whole complete what he's saying it says all this law was it was just a part of your of your journey and your understanding it was just to show you that you are in need of god the full thing to do the the complete thing the perfect the whole thing to do is now to accept your need for god to be in your heart changing your heart and that is being complete well there's a lot of us today who are obeying the rules, who don't get the spirit of the law. I see it in other believers. I see it in my own life that I have to repent and the Lord changes. And He gets on to me again and I change or whatever. Hopefully I'm continuing to change as He's molding me in His hands. Hopefully you too. But God should be continually showing us, hey, we're guilty of these things. I've been guilty of committing adultery. Even though I've never done that against my wife physically if i if i look at the word of god i have i've never killed anybody but if i look at the word of god if i look at the word, god saying if you've actually physically done it i'm concerned about what's in your heart and there are a lot of us that have murder in our heart we have stealing in our heart i can tell you that if it wasn't for the lord you know, I, I stole some things back whenever I was, before I was serving the Lord. I would have stolen everything I could get my hands on if I thought I could get away with it. But I, didn't, I knew I wasn't, couldn't get away with everything. That didn't mean, just because I couldn't get away with everything, some of the things I didn't steal, I'm just as guilty for not stealing them. I never stole a car. I never stole a car. But I would have if I thought I could get away with it. So God's saying, then you've stole a car. You're guilty of stealing a car. It's in your heart. Just because you couldn't find a way to pull it off doesn't mean that you're not guilty. Do you understand that? Well, that's really what's going on. We really got to be open to not be like David, not to be like Simon, this Pharisee who was in his house and he was like, could see his sin in everybody else's life. And we got to, let's not be like these these Jews that were among the saints at Rome who couldn't see that they are guilty. Paul says, man, you just, you're guilty. Don't nobody in this room think that you're not guilty. We'll conclude with James chapter 2. James chapter 2. It used to be between Hebrews uh, and Peter, but mine, no, there it is. Okay. James chapter 2. Let's read this. Uh, yeah. Starting verse 8. James is writing, he says this. You know, we've been talking about the law, right? And Jesus said, hey, you better obey the law. And he says, you're doing good if you command. Remember from Matthew chapter 5, he says, you're doing good if you obey the law, and you do good if you teach people to obey the law. But then he goes to what the law really is, and it's about the heart. And he goes beyond the physical commandments to what's wrong with the heart. And this is James and most agree that this is actually the brother of the Lord Jesus. Jesus had brothers. You know that, right? Uh, James was uh, another son of Mary. Um, Obviously, after, if you're like, wait a second, she was a virgin. Well, okay, yeah, well, not after she had Jesus. She ended up having more children. The Bible teaches us that. So you're going to say, oh, okay, yeah, all right. All right, so this afterwards, and and we don't know absolutely for certain, but, but, um, I think most, most people believe that this is the brother of the Lord according, and we could go through that, but we're not going to. So in James chapter 2 and verse 8, if you really fulfill the royal law according to the Scriptures, 
you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. Okay, love your neighbor as yourself. This is a royal law, okay? Meaning this, this word, I remember years ago doing a study on this. Royal is kind of like royalty, but it's kind of like a government type royalty to where um, this is a high law where other laws fall underneath it. So really, if you keep one particular, this law, all the laws that are hanging off of it are kept automatically. So let's say that there were 20 laws hanging off this royal law. All you had to do was obey that one royal law. All those 20 are obeyed. That's what he's getting at. He says, if you will fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. He says, you'd be, doing, you'd be in good shape if you can do this one thing. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convi convicted by the law of transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles in one point, he is guilty of all. Okay, that's that whole structure thing. You keep this one royal law um, uh, and all these ones that dangle underneath it. If you break this one law, law down here over here to the right that you think is not that big of a law, I can break that. You've broke the main law, which broke all the laws. Now, I know that might seem a little weird to you, but it's going to come real clear right here. It says a few in verse 10, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Verse 11, this is where it comes clear. For he who said, meaning God, the one who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. Both of these are under the same royal law. What is the royal law? Love your neighbor as yourself. Both of these are under the same law. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the whole law. So, it's simple. If I love my neighbor, I won't kill him. It's that simple. I won't kill him. So I don't have to worry about, oh my goodness, as a Christian, i got to remember that I don't kill my neighbor. All you got to do is to remember to love your neighbor and you will not kill him. And you will not steal from him. And you will not commit adultery. You will not sleep with his wife. And you will not do all these other things. Because really you only got to do one thing and that is love your neighbor. If you love him, none of those other things. So you don't have to say, oh my gosh, the law is overwhelming. God says, no, your heart is what needs to change. If your heart is right, then all these other things will be taken care of. And I think that's what we're guilty of. If we're guilty of not people being the people who walk in love, we are, we are lawbreakers. We are because we're love breakers. We're lawbreakers because we are breakers of the law of love. And I want you to know that I don't know if there's anybody in this room that is not guilty of being a lawbreaker, a love breaker. I find myself doing it. When I'm not as loving to you as I should be. When I'm not loving you the way that I should be. When I'm not loving my wife the way that I should be. When maybe I'm loving myself more than I am loving my wife. Loving somebody else. That's, that's a, a law breaker. I, I know some of you in here. I know some of your situations. I know some of your relationships. And I know that the Lord would want you to hear today. Quit being a law breaker. Quit being a love breaker. We're guilty. And we are inexcusable, oh man. We are inexcusable. Let's get it right before the Lord. Let's remove this from our eye today.